Hi everyone, today we're going to be talking about Cantor's theorem. This is a theorem that relates a set x to its power set, which is p of x. We're going to be talking about functions that go from x to p of x. But before we do that, let's talk about what the power set is. The power set is the set of all subsets of x. Let me give you an example so that it's clear what we're talking about. Let's say x is equal to the set with two elements, a and b. Then the power set of x is equal to the set that contains the empty set, because that's the subset that contains nothing at all the set that contains A, the set that contains B, and the set that contains both A and B, which was the original set X. So first of all, notice that the empty set is considered to be a subset, and the set itself is also considered to be a subset. And what Cantor's theorem says is the following. It says, first of all, that there does not exist a function that goes from x to the power set of x such that f is a surjection. And by the way, this is um, assuming that x is not equal to the empty set itself. And secondly, the second part is much easier to prove. It says that there does exist a function, let's call it g, going from x to the power set of x, such that g is an injection. We're going to be proving this today. Now philosophically what this means is that the power set of x is bigger somehow than x. This isn't too hard to see for finite sets x, but um, it gets harder to visualize once you have infinite sets. But nonetheless, we will be able to prove it. Let's prove it. The proof is going to be similar to Russell's paradox. If you've seen that before, this should be a piece of cake. Suppose x is a non-empty set, and suppose, for contradiction, that there exists a function going from x to the power set of x that is a surjection. We're going to be deriving a contradiction from this assumption. Here's the key insight that Cantor had. This is quite difficult to come up with and they tried to get a computer to come up with it and the only way that they could do so was by giving it strong hints. So don't be surprised if it's a bit strange to look at because coming up with it is not easy. First of all, we're going to be defining the Cantor diagonal set of F, which is defined as follows. D is equal to the set of elements of capital X such that X is not an element of its image. 
And this makes sense because f of x here goes to the power set of x. So it can, f of x is a set of elements and we're saying that x cannot be in f of x. It's this construction that is Cantor's brilliant insight. Now secondly, so that's the first insight. Secondly, you notice that D is a subset of X because we define it as elements of X. So D is an element of the power set of X. Three, since F is assumed to be surjective, that means some some element hits hits D since D is an element of P of X. So uh, formally we're just going to write this as there exists a Y in capital X such that F of Y is equal to D. Okay, now, now is when the fun begins because we're going to derive a contradiction very similar to the contradiction in Russell's paradox. So the question is, is Y an element of D or Y is not an element of D? Because remember, D is an element of the power set of X. So it consists of elements of X and Y is an element of X. So it's a reasonable thing to ask whether Y is an element of D or Y is not an element of D. Let's see what happens. There are two possibilities. If Y is an element of D, then according to the definition of D, Y is not an element of F of Y, but F of Y is equal to D. So y, equal, y being an element of D implies that Y is not an element of D. That's a contradiction. So we go to the other possibility, which is if Y is not an element of D, then the opposite is true, which is the negation of Y is not an element of F of Y. Again, we're using this definition. And that is logically equivalent to Y is an element of F of Y, which is equal to D. So in this case, we get that Y being an, not an element of D implies that Y is an element of D. So again, we have a contradiction. So either way, we have a contradiction. What does this mean? So F cannot be a surjection. There is no surjection F from X to the power set of X. Okay, so let's go back to the statement of the theorem. We said that uh, there is no surjection from x to the power set of x and we just proved that. Now we need to prove that th but there is in fact an injection from x to the power set of x and that's not too difficult. We can define it in one line. The injection will be defined as g going from x to the power set of x and is defined as each element x will be mapped to the singleton containing x and it's not difficult to verify that this is in fact an injection because if we have x equal the set containing x being equal to the set containing y that implies x is equal to y so that, that proves injectivity
Okay, um, I just want to leave you with a stronger idea because what we what this really means is that if we have x and we take the power set of x and then we take the power set again so we get the power set of the power set of x and then we take the power set again so we get the power set of the power set of the power set of x and we keep doing this the idea is that we want to show that okay we start with x over here then we have the power set of x and that's going to be a bigger set and then we have the power set of the power set of x it's going to be an even bigger set we're just going to keep going up to infinity and what we want to show is that yes we know that there does not exist a surjection from x to p of x but what if there's a surjection from p of x to p of p of p of x is it possible for an earlier set to have a surjection to a later set and the answer is no so let's prove that let's call these p naught p1 p2, p3, and so on, where pk means we applied the power set axiom k times. So this one is p0, this one is p1, this one is p2, this one is p3, and so on. Now we proved that there are injections so here's what we'll do we'll we'll assume there exists a surjection from p of m to p of n for some m less than n okay this is for contradiction for contradiction and what we're going to do is that we're, we're going to derive a contradiction from this. So let's say we have PM as an injection to PM plus 1. We know that exists. Then there's an injection to P of M plus 2 all the way through to P of N minus 1 to P of N. Okay. So we know there's an injection here. We know there's an injection here, we know there's an injection here and here. So we're going to compose them all, okay? If we compose them all, we get an injection going from here to here. So we get an injection from P of M to P of N minus 1. Now, I'm going to be quoting a theorem here. It's not difficult to prove, but if there's an injection like that, then there exists a surjection going from P of N minus 1 to P of M. Okay, so now we're going to head in the other direction and go from here to here. And what we know is that well what we've assumed is that there is a surjection from p of m to p of n so let's call that one g and let's call this one f and what we'll do is define their composition define h to be first we apply f and over it we compose g and um, once we do that h is also a surjection but h goes from p of n minus 1 to P of M to P of N 
So that's a surjection from p of n minus 1 to p of n. And that is a contradiction because Cantor's theorem says that's impossible. So we just combined a bunch of injections, we reversed it to get a big surjection, and we composed it over our contradictory surjection to get a surjection from p of n minus 1 to p of n. Okay, let's do a quick recap. I won't go over the proof again, but I'll just go over the main points of what we covered. So today we talked about Cantor's theorem. I stated Cantor's theorem, which says that there doesn't exist a surjection from a set to its power set, but there does exist an injection in the same direction. And philosophically, this means that the power set is somehow bigger than the set itself. We used a contradiction to prove Cantor's theorem, the first part of it. The crux of the matter was defining the Cantor diagonal set. And then we, uh, we looked at two cases. One is that y is an element of d, and the other is that y is not an element of d. Either way, we got a contradiction. And finally, we easily define an injection going from x to the power set of x. And in the end, we showed that the mathematical universe in it, when we take the power set axiom repeatedly, we get bigger and bigger and bigger sets. Because no earlier set can map to a later set in, an, in a surjective manner. Okay, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.